Well, a few weeks ago, I was uh, on the hunt for a new show on Netflix. I stumbled across something that I recognized, and it was the title of a book that I'd noticed my wife, Corey, had been reading uh, just some time ago. And I said, look, isn't that the book? You like that book, right? And she said, yes, yes, I've been wanting to see it. It was all the light we cannot see, which, you know, I meant that sounds kind of difficult, right? If it's can't see it, then how do you know it's light? I I haven't read the book, so I don't know. And I was hooked, like in the first 10 minutes, it's about a girl who's blind, living through the end of the Second World War. And both blindness and wartime make it kind of hard to see the light. And so we watched a couple episodes together, and then we had a pause because we left on vacation. And we were vacationing in Hawaii, and it's like the perfect time to get some sunlight uh, right here before the darkness begins. And so while we were in Hawaii, you know, we didn't watch that much TV. There's better things to do. And so when we returned home, I was excited to see the rest of the series. And Corey says to me, oh, Bryn and I binge watched that on the plane. Like, let's watch something else. <laughs> I'm like, what? You're just going to leave me in the dark like that? Pun intended, right? So instead of all the light we cannot see at our house, I decided it's all the light I cannot see. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to see the light. Well, we're starting a new series today for Advent. It's called Unwrapping the Names of Jesus, and it's based on this Advent devotional. If you haven't picked uh, one of these up this week, you're going to want to do it. Just Amazon it. It'll be here in a couple days. And this is by, I actually had to watch a quick podcast or a YouTube to find out just how to pronounce the author's name right. It's Asherita Choo Choo. Okay? No joke. Just like the train. Asherita Choo Choo. Uh, Very excellent Advent devotional, and if you have the book, you know, this week we start on week one, and it's all about hope, all about hope, and each day there's a different name of Jesus that that gives you a quick little devotional, um, you know, snapshot of what that is, uh, a scripture, and then the end of each week, it's kind of cool, it has uh, suggested activities, these can be family-friendly activities, some of them are service ideas, and so... um, There's only five each week, so it like gives you grace days too. It's a good thing. You're gonna wanna enjoy it. If if you can't do that, we also provide a cheat sheet, which is right here. You can pick these up on the back tables, and this kind of gives you uh, a brief overview. Also, activities and some devotional ideas. Um, You can pick that up on your way out. Well, last week, we were lucky to have Del Clark launch us into the Advent season, and he spoke to us about the hope we have as Christians. You know, it is more than just wishful thinking. And the hope that we share in Christ is because God cares for us. He hasn't forgotten us. He sent his son to us. And over the season of Advent, uh, you know, we celebrate things like hope. The early church has been observing Advent. You know, it's, it's just an invented thing. In fact, in the church calendar, this marks the beginning of the new year. Advent does. And so it's a, it's a time of press preparation, of anticipation, because Advent number one already happened. That's the celebration of the birth of Christ, what we do every year. But then as Christians, we have our hope. We anticipate Advent number two, when Christ returns once again, when God finally and fully restores and redeems and fixes this broken world uh, that's, what we, that's what we live for. Right now, we're kind of stuck in between the now and the not yet. And so Advent can become such an important season for us to just mark as Christians. And I promise you, even if you feel stuck in between now and the not yet, even if it feels like you live in the dark and you can't see the light, Jesus is the light of the world. His presence can dwell with us in the darkness He can guide us through the night. He is our hope. So our reading this morning comes from two places in the Gospel of John. One is at the beginning, the other partway through. One is a statement about Jesus, and the other is a statement by Jesus. Both of these are rather bold. John 1, verse 1 through 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. 
And that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And then a statement by Jesus in John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That phrase, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Never walk in darkness. Have you ever felt like you're walking in darkness? Well, as I mentioned just a few weeks ago, we were in Hawaii, and someone suggested the first day that we were there that we should go down onto the beach at night and find the turtles, because the sea turtles, big sea turtles, crawl out onto the beach to stay warm during the night. And evidently, they can't see underwater in the dark. I don't know. Maybe some of them can. But the first evening, we decided this was such a great idea. We ventured down to the beach. And the particular place where we were walking wasn't next to any resort. So there, there wasn't, like, lights right on the beach. In fact, there was kind of this park. It was really really dark, and we were walking on loose sand. There was brushes and scrub brush that we were trying to avoid, and I just couldn't see. So I pulled out my, my trusty iPhone, right, to light the way. And suddenly, this voice from the darkness booms out, hey, shut off that light. You're going to blind the turtles. <laughs> I'm thinking, is that the voice of God? Right? Like, oh my goodness. No, it was just a local volunteer protecting turtles from stupid tourists. And uh, sure enough, I turned off the light, and like six feet in front of me was this little dark mass. It was a sea turtle, and I could see, you know, as my lights started to adjust, I could see more and more turtles on the beach. It was, it was really, really, really cool, but also hard to walk in the dark. So when Jesus says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, was he talking about literal darkness? No, he was not. He was painting an emphatic picture of what your experience of life could be like if you choose to follow him. It's like him saying it's night and day. And without Christ to light the way, you're walking in the dark, which is, we know, is all really hard to do. To understand the force of Jesus' statement here, I am the light of the world, you have to know where he said it. He said it at the Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem, specifically at the temple. And Feast of the Tabernacles, think, um, it, it's like an autumn harvest festival. And the way that the Israelites used to do festivals is pretty great. It, it was eight days long. So, I mean, that's quite a quite a party. And always after the last of the harvest was in, it would begin, you know, within a few days. And it was meant to celebrate God's continued provision of them through this, you know, recent harvest, but also for them to remember life in the wilderness during the Exodus, the 40 years that Israel wandered really out in the dark when God provided for them. It was a way of God saying, hey, I've got you. Remember, I will provide for you. I will guide and protect you. So they would, you know, this feast happened every year. It was called Tabernacles, which sometimes that's confusing because we associate that with the tabernacle, like the place where God dwells, and that eventually became the temple. But a tabernacle is really just like a tent. So sometimes it's called the Festival of the Booths. People build these in their backyard, and they sleep out, camp out in them, just as a reminder of God's faithfulness. And so in Jesus' time, the last night of the feast, they would light these four, you know, four huge lamps. And when we think of a lamp, you know, we're, we're thinking of just a, a little light bulb. No, these were enormous. They were like hanging cauldrons that were filled with olive oil, and they would use whole garments as the wick, okay? So that gives you a sense of the scale. These things were massive. 
And so they would light these in the temple courts. You know, an orchestra would play. Men would dance around with torches, singing praises to God. I mean, it was enchanting. It was festive. It was beautiful. In fact, rabbinical writings from that time period describe it as a wonder. This was a wonder. And in a world without, like, public night lights, you could, I mean, every night it's dark. And then suddenly you can see in the distance the temple glowing, you know, bathed in these lights. It would have been spectacular and moving. Well, in ancient Judaism, light symbolized God's presence. Have you ever heard the lamp of God, a.k.a. the menorah? i got a picture for you. We're not really sure, uh, Bruce, you can put that up. We're not really sure what the menorah in the temple looked like. In fact, there was, it started with one. This was written about in the Torah, like Moses was commanded to make this lamp, which stood inside the tabernacle and in, in the temple, and eventually they made more. But this, this is like the national emblem of Israel. And, and for those of, you, uh, those of you like me who aren't Jewish, you go, oh, isn't that you know, Hanukkah? Well, yeah, Hanukkah was the Maccabean Revolt, 164 BC, when, when they had one day of oil for the, the temple menorah, and it didn't run out of oil. It lasted eight days till they could make more. That's where the tradition, the, the, the celebration of Hanukkah began. So as you can see, the, the centerpiece of really the emblem of Israel is the lamp of God. And it originally resided just outside the Holy of Holies. It's symbolic. It's light. It's the presence of the Lord. All throughout the Old Testament, there's allusions to light as a metaphor of God's presence. The book of Psalm has many. Psalm 27.1, the Israelites would sing these words. They would say, the Lord is the light and my salvation. Psalm 119 describes the word of God as a, a light to guide the path of those who cherish instruction. King David declares in 2 Samuel 22:29, You, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. The prophet Isaiah, as we're reading this morning, but in lots of other places, he applies a messianic theme to this. He, he talks about the servant of the Lord was appointed as a light to the Gentiles that he might bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth. But the most notable examples come from the Exodus, where the glory of the Lord was visible to people. During the daytime, it was visible as a cloud. During the nighttime, it was a pillar of fire, meant to you know, provide light, but also to guide Israel on their way. And then... Um, God's presence, oh, I'm sorry, God's presence, so God's presence was seen as that. And both day and night, it was like his glory was on display. So here's Jesus in the temple courts at the festival, kind of commemorating the Exodus. And he's standing there in the glow of the temple, and he says, I am, which was the sacred name of God revealed to Moses, I am the light of the world. Now notice he didn't say, I'm the light of Jerusalem. Or I'm the light of Israel. No, very significantly, he says, I'm the light of the world. Everyone and everything in it. And he doesn't let it hang. He immediately says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So that, that phrase, whoever follows me, that's a connection to following a cloud or a pillar of fire. It would have been unmistakable to his listeners. Uh, the connection to the presence of God himself would have been vivid in hearing Jesus say, I am the light of the world. In fact, the Pharisees, the 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 teachers of the law, they knew it right away what he was saying, and they immediately challenged Jesus. I am the light of the world. I mean, who says that? 
Jesus says that. If you follow me, you won't get lost. I'll guide you. If you follow me, you'll never be alone because my presence is with you. Yes, Jesus is talking about salvation, but he's also talking about everyday life. You will have the light of life. If Jesus is the light, then we never have to walk in darkness again, do we? If we follow him, if we follow him, we'll never have to walk in darkness again. You know, it's remarkable to me that 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Jesus being the light of the world. I mean, the Apostle John, the early church, and generations of Christians ever since have actually applied that as a proper name to Jesus, the light of the world. Why? Why do you think that is? Because we need the light. We're drawn to the light that's only found in God. Most of us understand all too well what it's like to live in a world full of darkness. I mean, you, you would have to live in a bubble these days not to notice all that's going on, all that's broken, the disappointment and despair. We need the light. You know, at the opening of this message, I mentioned the book, All the Light We Cannot See. It's written by Anthony Doerr. And in that, it juxtaposes the darkness a person experiences who's blind with like the darkness, the ultimate darkness of humanity when it's at war, just the uncertainty, the barbaricness of all of it. And since I, since I did, I'm going to do a very unpastor-like thing right here, right? I mean, who's ever, it's, I haven't read the book, that's never stopped me from forming an opinion, right? But since I hadn't read the book, I didn't get to see the show, not bitter about that, I decided to ask my wife, Corey, like, so tell me, what exactly does that phrase mean, all the light you cannot see? And she said, well, I think it's the joy and the hope and the goodness in people in the world that's still present even during the darkest times. She said, it's like, you know, it's like love and grace and truth and hope. You can't really see those things, but they are real. And in fact, we know they exist often when we see them displayed in others or when they're shared with us. I thought, how true. All the light we cannot see. And it struck me that Jesus so often is asking people if they see. Um, in fact, the parable of the sower that I think Angela preached on that just a few weeks ago, that has this section in there where Jesus quotes Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, who, who made this statement like, may you be ever hearing but never understanding, um, ever seeing but never perceiving. What exactly does that mean, Jesus He's talking about, you know, some people are just ready and receptive to believe in the reality or to, to notice God in their everyday life. And some people, for whatever reason, are just closed off to it. Uh, I, I had a friend in, in high school, actually, who just, he, he'd tell me, Dan, I'd be, it'd be easy to believe in Christ if I could just see a miracle. And, and I laugh. I'm like, well, if you read the Gospels, there's lots of people who see the miracles and they still don't believe. So that whole idea, uh, I mean, in fact, Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides. Just because you aren't blind doesn't mean you can see. All the, all the light we cannot see, qualities lo like love, kindness, joy, and hope, aren't those the reflection of God in us? I mean, it might be a very dim or imperfect reflection, but, but that's in us. Everyone is made in the image of God. And when we have moments or even seasons where we feel like we're surrounded by darkness, when we feel lost, when all hope is fleeting, when we wonder where is the light, that's when we need Christ. That's when we need the forgiveness that's only found in him. That's when we need the power of his resurrection, when we need his healing, his restoration, his transformation of our heart and soul. We need the light of the world, amen? amen. 
You know, the Apostle Paul wrote the church in Ephesus. He said this, For you were once in darkness, but now, you're the, now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. He goes on in verse 10, And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. But here's the thing. Christ will not just shine on you. When you put your faith and re- let your hope rest on Christ, I mean, light, his light shines in you, through you. Don't hide the light. When you're a child of the Almighty, when you're a child of the light, let the light shine. And I wanted to close our time together this morning by sharing um, one of my favorite illustrations that uh, or illustrates this point so beautiful, beautifully. And I, I know that I've shared this before, but it's been a while. Um, in 1990, uh, President George H.W. Bush was dedicating the National Cathedral that's in Washington, D.C. And it, it has this enormous stained glass window in it. And it's like the centerpiece. You walk in the sanctuary, and I mean, it's just unmistakable. There it is. And so during that, he he gave this speech, and during the speech, he compared the human soul to a stained glass window, and he said this, from where we stand now, the rose window high above seems black and formless to some, perhaps, but when we enter, we see it backlit from the sun. It dazzles in astonishing splendor and reminds us that without faith, We, too, are but stained glass windows in the dark. We, too, are but, without faith, without the light of Christ, we, too, are but stained glass windows in the dark. And at his memorial service, uh, Reverend Russell Levinson said that President Bush understood that even in the darkest of nights, things can be transformed if handed over to the redemptive power of the Almighty. No one on that first Good Friday expected Easter Sunday, but it came. It came because the light that brought creation into being also brought life from the grave. You know, without faith, we're all just like stained glass windows in the dark. But when the light of Christ dwells within, our eternal hope rests with the one who can bring life from the grave. He's Jesus the one who we celebrate this Christmas and every Christmas, the one who we all know as the light of the world. Please join me in prayer. It's not just a cliche, Lord. You live long enough and life can not just seem, but can be pretty dark. Help us, Lord, if we've lost our way, to return towards the light, just a small step, whatever that may mean. And Lord, maybe we've never had that light. Might we choose it for the first time? We put our faith and our trust. We let our hope rest in you, Lord. You're the light of the world. We celebrate you and pray this in your powerful name.